Well, good afternoon, everyone. So thanks very much for this really unique opportunity. So um, graduate students here, hands up. Got a few undergrads. People who aren't undergrads or graduate students. OK, so we've got a pretty broad audience here. So uh, my name is Ori Rothstein. I'm a surgeon by day. and. I do other things by the rest of the time I'm here. So first of all, I want to start off by congratulating the Institute of Medical Science on uh, bringing this forward to everybody here because it's a really exciting program as far as I can tell. So <clears throat> my area of interest uh, from the research standpoint and also my clinical area of interest is trauma. Now, um, trauma is something that hits the headlines. Um, but interestingly, trauma is never something that often hits the uh, lay public unless, in fact, uh, something happens. So the tragedy that we saw last week, for example, is what brought trauma to the forefront. Motor vehicle accidents that occur around the world, 1.2 million per year, about 3,000 per day around the world, their mortality is related to motor vehicle accidents. But what's not appreciated is that not only is there mortality related to it, but there are other things related to that as well which is morbidity. Trauma affects youth. And when trauma affects youth, people are left with a lot of problems, uh, long-term disability, and a long time in hospital. So there's a tremendous morbidity related to trauma, not just the deaths that occur, but also the long-term morbidity about it. And that's our interest. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, since we have a very broad audience, there are only three things that you need to know. And I have them up here on my glossary. So there are three words. Number one is shock. So shock is when you lose a lot of blood and your blood pressure goes down, like what might happen in a car accident if you cut your leg or, or have some other injury. The second one is something called ischemia reperfusion injury. So interestingly, that when you go into shock and people come to help you, resuscitate you by giving you fluids and your blood pressure comes back up, there's actually this paradoxical injury. You would think it would be good for you only to have your increase in injury to the organs. And the third important term is neutrophils. So neutrophils are cells in our own body. Those are cells that are used all the time uh, to kill bacteria. But it turns out that in patients who have major trauma, neutrophils in your own body injure you. And they're very important. And strategies that prevent neutrophils from going to areas in the organs will actually potentially help you. And so these are the three terms you need to know. They're the only three terms I'll use, shock, ischemia reperfusion, and neutrophils. Those are the three things you need to know. OK, let's talk a little bit about mortality related to trauma. There are probably three major areas where someone might die related to trauma. Uh, number one is that the, which occurs right at the scene. So basically, uh, if you get a massive head injury or you lose so much blood that you can't be resuscitated, you could die there. Uh, secondarily, you could die uh, once you get to hospital and you get into the milieu where you have surgeons looking after you, nurses looking after you, intensivists looking after you. Usually that's because of a residual head injury because the surgeons usually stop the bleeding. The other major area is later on in your overall hospital stay. So you've survived your head injury, you've survived your blood loss, but it's interesting that about a third of the people who survive to that area eventually succumb to uh, what we call multiple organ failure. And the major organs that are affected in the multiple organ failure are the liver, the lungs, the brain, uh, the kidneys. Those are all ones that over time can actually be affected by that initial injury that you have. And one of the interesting concepts in uh, the development of organ failure is the fact that something that happens very early on, so during this initial time when you're in shock and you're coming on your way to the hospital, can actually influence what happens later on in your overall disease state. So let's talk about what it looks like to have hemorrhagic shock and get injury. Here's two pictures. So up on the top, it's normal. On the left side, you can see liver. On the right side, you can see lung. Pretty benign looking. But if you look at them on the bottom panels, on the left, again, liver, and on the right, again, lung, you can see within those uh, pictures, there's a lot of black dots. And black dots are basically neutrophils going into tissues. And the important point here is that neutrophils go into tissues, and strategies potentially that prevent neutrophils from going into tissues may, in fact, be able to prevent the injury that occurs. And that's a common strategy that's used to manage patients or uh, manage patients who come in uh, with injury. 
So let's go back to this. I want to talk about the one part that is of most interest to me. That's the first period. What happens between the time that you get injured and you arrive in the hospital? That time is all in the ambulance. That time is considered to be very important in priming your system, getting your body more susceptible to subsequent problems that you might have in a hospital. And that's where our area of research has been primarily. Because what's interesting is that when you come to the hospital, either by ambulance, in the air, or on the ground, the paramedics are working furiously to keep you alive and to sustain you. They're looking after your airway. They're looking after your breathing. They're stopping any bleeding that goes on. They're looking after your circulation. But interestingly, they do fairly straightforward things. They, they basically are doing very uh, straightforward uh, interventions just to keep you alive to get to where you need to be, which is in the hospital, to get your uh, trauma looked after. And so our group's interest, and my own personal interest, relates to what can you do in the ambulance while the patient is on the way to the hospital. And um, there's a, a notion called the golden period. And the golden period is actually that period while you're between having your trauma to when you actually get into the hospital. That is the shock that you have, the blood loss that you have, and that initial resuscitation that you have. That's a period that's felt for uh, scientists and people who work in the field to be a period in which we may be able to intervene. And the goal of intervening there is to prevent something early on with a view of pre preventing something later on like that multiple organ failure. So we call it the two hit. The initial hit is shock resuscitation. The second hit is something else like an infection or bleeding that might occur in a hospital. And the idea is that when the patient isn't too sick and they're undergoing shock resuscitation, you might be able to do something to help them at that time. So I'm just going to give you an example of one area that we're working on right now. It's called remote ischemic preconditioning. So what that means is that what we do in uh, patients and also now in experimental animals is that we put a tourniquet on the leg of patients or experimental animals or on their arm. We inflate it, deflate it, inflate it, deflate it, inflate it, deflate it. Multiple sequences to make the arm ischemic. So low blood flow in the arm and then restore it again low blood flow in the arm, then you restore it again. And there are a number of studies, both experimental and in humans, that show, in fact, that by doing that remote ischemic preconditioning, that you can actually prevent ultimate events. And the way that most people have looked at it is, let me give you one example, is that in patients who have bypasses in their heart, so patients who have bypasses in their heart for disease in the arteries actually sometimes uh, have ischemic injury, ischemia reperfusion injury to the heart when you do the operation. So there are studies that are well documented that if you do ischemic preconditioning and somebody undergoing a heart operation, you can actually protect the heart. So remote preconditioning can prevent subsequent ischemia reperfusion injury, prevent the priming that occurs, and then prevent the ischemia reperfusion injury. And that's the idea. So since our area is in hemorrhagic shock and resuscitation, we asked the question whether or not we could do ischemic preconditioning in patients, or for us, now experimental animals, to see whether or not that could prevent the injury that occurred from ischemia reperfusion, shock resuscitation. And when you think of it, it's not just one organ that gets affected, it's multiple organs. It's the lung, it's the liver, it's the heart, it's the brain. So the idea is that you pre-treat with ischemic preconditioning, and then you look at what happens related to actually getting uh, the subsequent injury to the organs. So, of course, it's always good to have a model to prepare yourself to do these. Um, uh, and I'm going to show you two examples of models that we use, some that are pretty straightforward, but others are a little bit off the wall in terms of the normal models that we as biological scientists would use. So the first model that we have is a murine model or a mouse model. And what we do is that we have a setup in our research group where you can actually put the mouse into shock, and then you can resuscitate the animal just like you would in man. But in the experiments that we did, what we did was precondition those animals. So as you can see here, before the shock resuscitation, we actually put this on the hind limb of the animal, blow it up, let it down, blow it up, let it down, blow it up, let it down. Ischemic preconditioning. And then what we did is at the end of resuscitation down the road, we actually looked at what happened to the organs. And so here are some pictures that we might have. So the one on the left, this is the liver. The one on the left 
shows what happens in the mouse when you put them into shock and you resuscitate them. And there are three things that are pretty obvious. There are lots of neutrophils there, lots of black dots. There is a lot of hemorrhage there, so you can see here that there are uh, red blood cells throughout the liver. And then finally, the architecture is totally messed up. And you compare that to the one on the right. The one on the right looks perfectly normal, as if that animal has never had problems. No neutrophils, no bleeding in the liver, and absolutely no change in the architecture. So doing this preconditioning actually prevented the liver injury that animals normally get. Well, we also looked at other organs, since multiple organs are affected. And this is a graph, a histogram, of what happens in the lung, looking at protein in the lung. And the more protein you have in the lung, the worse you are. That means your lungs are leaky. And you can see that in the middle graph, that there's a huge increase after shock resuscitation if you actually uh, do that, measure it in the lung. But in the animals that have uh, preconditioning on their legs, you can see in the far right of that that there's absolutely no lung leakiness, no albumin in the lung. So by doing this preconditioning, it actually protected the lungs, protected the liver. So I guess one might suggest, well, if this is a trauma, like who really cares if you can precondition people? Because you can never anticipate that somebody's going to get a car accident or some other trauma. Um, at least I don't think you can. And so one of the questions that we wondered about was, could we actually do what we call per conditioning? So could we, instead of doing it antecedent to the shock resuscitation, could we do it in the, kind of, in the whole milieu? Think about it. It's a little like, bit like being in an ambulance. So a patient gets picked up in an ambulance. They're in shock. They're being resuscitated. So during that time, could we do this simple intervention, like putting a blood pressure cuff onto that person to actually do ischemic preconditioning? We call that perconditioning. And I'll show you the data um, showing that actually uh, we can do that per conditioning. So even if we wait to start this ischemia reperfusion in the leg, we can actually prevent it. So we had four groups, a control group. We had the group I showed you before, which is preconditioning. We had the next group where right in the middle of the activity, we did um, the uh, conditioning. And then we have something post-conditioning. So even after they're being resuscitated to see whether or not this intermittent compression of the leg in the animal could actually make a difference in uh, the animals. And as you can see in this slide, um, there are differences. So as I showed you before, uh, preconditioning markedly reduces the, the injury. Uh, Per-conditioning markedly reduces the injury. And post-conditioning actually market, markedly reduces the injury. So you can see that even if the mouse already had shock resuscitation, you could affect the later injury that occurs, suggesting that it might be able to do that in men. So I want to tell you a tale about a little bit of kind of alternate thinking in terms of understanding the mechanism. This is a zebrafish. So zebrafishes are transparent. And the cool thing about zebrafish is that you can actually make molecules that are fluorescent. So you can see them under a fluorescent microscope. And this particular zebrafish is one in which the neutrophils, those cells that go into the organs, are made green fluorescent. So you can see them under a fluorescent microscope. And so you can see the dots all over the place. Each of those is a neutrophil. Now, just to prove to you that this is actually a zebra fish, I can have it swim off. And you can see how that goes. And the other thing that I can do is show you a little bit of a video of how we induce an inflammatory response. You can actually cut off the tail of the zebra fish. And the little green dots you can see are moving into the picture. And they're going to, towards the tail, where the injury is. So just like in man, when you get injury and the neutrophils go there, the zebrafish is an organism that you can do that in as well. And it mimics man to a certain extent because the neutrophils are similar, but also it goes to areas of, of organ injury. So we hypothesize that during our ischemic preconditioning, that actually there might be a substance that gets released into the blood, out of the leg, that might affect the ability of the neutrophils to actually get into the tissue, just like they affected the ability of the neutrophils to get into the liver and the lung. And here is a, a study that you look on the left. These are the control animals. So these are the ones we just cut off their tail. And you can see that in the tail on the far left, there are lots and lots of neutrophils. It's almost totally fluorescent green. However, if you take the material that we recovered from the blood of the animals that had ischemic preconditioning, we actually were able to prevent 
the neutrophils from going into the area. So you can see that uh, basically it's not as dense at the far left end, uh, but also when you look at the graphics, you can see that in the middle, and it's significantly reduced in animals, zebrafish, in which you injected this little bit of plasma that came from the ischemic preconditioning M. So just to uh, make a couple of points to close. Uh, first of all, um, we find this uh, very interesting work uh, because um, it has potential for something that you might be able to do while the patient is on the way to the hospital. A very simple intervention. While the patient is sick, while the patient is being resuscitated, you could potentially do this ischemic preconditioning on the leg. You also would know that it's obviously important to understand exactly what the mechanism is. And so we're now going to move forward and actually look at the mechanism by using a little bit more uh, investigation of what's in the plasma. And so this is how we're going to do it. We're going to take the plasma, we're going to partition it into several different molecular weights, and actually we're going to take that uh, plasma of several different components and actually inject it into the zebrafish. And you can see that this is a very good model to be able to test for a lot of things because zebrafish are easy to work with. And more importantly is that you can actually do this robotically. So you know, from a robotic standpoint, we could actually do multiple compounds, multiple zebrafish, and actually discern what exactly is the molecule that's exerting its effect on the inhibition of neutrophil function. Then we can recover the, um, the substance, we can define what the substance is, and then potentially and ultimately injected into animals and ultimately in man as a surrogate for actually uh, doing the, sh the pumping on the leg. Now, having said that, that's a long, it's a difficult, it's a tedious process. And so why can't we just start pumping on the legs? So why can't we take people in the province of Ontario and beyond and during their transport to the hospital start putting these blood pressure cuffs? We can, and we're starting to organize those clinical trials right now in patients in the province of Ontario and I think it's going to be very exciting to see what happens to those patients who are now getting this per conditioning because it's while they're doing uh, their transport into the hospital. So just to close and tell you how interesting biology is. So I talked a lot about ischemia reperfusion injury. I talked a little bit about how preconditioning could prevent that ischemia reperfusion injury. Some uh, scientists asked the question whether or not top-level athletes who are really exerting their muscles and getting a lot of lactic acid and a lot of stretch on their muscles are actually getting ischemia reperfusion injury into their muscles while they're doing that heavy exertion. So the question they said was, well, if preconditioning works in uh, subsequent uh, medical models of ischemia reperfusion, might it work in the model of human? And so here's work from the University of Calgary that just shows you how ideas on the biological science side might go into really practical things. They very clearly showed that if you gave preconditioning to high-level athletes, swimmers here, that actually they improved their performance. So for the same reason that we're able to protect the ischemic reperfusion injury in man and, and for cardiac bypass, in animals for shock resuscitation, it looks like you can protect the same thing in animals as well, suggesting the breadth of the implications of this ischemic preconditioning. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm uh, very grateful that you're here this afternoon.